This episode of the Sloopcast is brought to you by the Mad Canadian Barbecue Company. The Mad Canadian Barbecue Company is an Ohio-based company where they usually say our seasonings will take your barbecue from good to great. Great seasonings such as the Cajun, the Savory, the Discord, and the Four Horsemen. Can't go wrong with any of the seasonings over at the Mad Canadian BBQ.com. That is the Mad Canadian BBQ.com. Be sure to head on over to the Mad Canadian's website to check out his great seasoning packets that you can purchase over at the Mad Canadian BBQ.com. That is the Just Send It, the Sweet Heat, and the Whole Hog, which is one of each of the great seasonings over at the Mad Canadian. Be sure to also use the promo code SLIPCAST10 at checkout for 10% off your entire order. Mad Canadian Barbecue Company, where they have your butt covered. This episode of the Sloopcast also brought to you by the Iron Bean Coffee Company. The Iron Bean Coffee Company is a world-class hand-roasted micro-batch, fresh roasted-to-order coffee company. They are based out of Perrysburg, Ohio, which if you don't know is just outside of Toledo. All of their beans are fair trade certified and USDA organic. Integrity is a core value because they do what is right even when no one is looking. They import all of their beans from uh, directly from the farmers. Uh, they're single origin beans. K-cups are available. Gift cards are available. Free shipping over $50. And you can save money with a subscribe and save service. All of this and more can be found at ironbeancoffee.com. That's Iron Bean Coffee, America's local coffee roaster. What's up, YouTube and Discord? Don't forget about the Discord. We got live yes. listeners in the Discord channel. The dog's still trying to recover from the celebration that was Friday night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mine are just off camera. I'm mm -hmm. still messing with the camera rig in the new studio, so I'm not I'm not quite comfortable enough yet to like take it down and start moving it because I don't know if it's going to go back the way I want it. But they're they're here and they're sleeping. Just take my word for it. If you see this, this blanket. Oh my, I'm, I'm, I'm not in mirror mode anymore and it's screwing with my head. If you see this blanket, oh wait, is that, can you see a little bit of Apollo yep. right there? A little bit see of Apollo a little bit right there. there. You see the blanket moving around during the episode? Know that that's not like wind, that's pure dog. All right, Kyle, we have a lot of episode to get to. Let's quit screwing around. Let's rejoin our audio listeners. We've got barbecue back here. You're all invited. Well, welcome to the Sloopcast. How are you doing today, Kyle? Doing pretty well. How are you today, Jared? <laughs> you know, 2021, man. It's 2021. It's everything's better now. People are like, yes. oh, you know, the, everyone was like real mad at 2020 for very obvious reasons. And then everyone is just like, eh, I don't know why everyone thinks it just because 2021 means everything's going to be better. Like we know. Mm. We, we understand well, that the actual calendar turning over isn't going to match. We understand that. It's a speaking meme. Of, we speaking get of that, Jared, but speaking of that. 2021, as it turns out, has been better. Yes, we, we all, all 2020, we kept saying, this is the year of the tight end. Nope. I'd come to our understanding from once it turned 2021, 2021 is... The year of the tight end. Three touchdowns by tight ends in the Sugar Bowl. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, it's it's obviously the year of the tight end now, right? Yeah, we'll get into that yeah, a little, that, bit, that's, that's, a little, that's bit, a little bit later here. Let's, let's talk about the big news on the recruiting front yeah, yeah, yeah. for the 2022 just, just class. Quick, this episode is going to be dedicated almost entirely to the Sugar Bowl. Five minutes, but five minutes on the clock. We have two pieces of news. I'm I'm checking the time code right now. We get no more than five minutes on these two pieces of news. All right. All right, Jared. All right. First one, first one here is, is Singletary. Yes. The one of the best corners to come out of the 2022 class from Jacksonville, Florida, makes his announcement Saturday to join Ohio State for the 2022 class. Yeah, this is a five-star prospect per the 24-7 sports composite. He's the 10th best overall player 
Like it's kind of it's it's kind of funny. I don't feel like this got enough hype because it happened the day after the Sugar Bowl. But he's a top 10 player in the country. Top 10 mm-hmm. in the 2020 Again, this is the 2022 class. This is not the class that just had their signing day. This is the 2022 class. 10th overall best player in the entire country committed to Ohio State the day after the Sugar Bowl. Uh, don't don't by the way, don't don't get confused and think that it was because of the Sugar Bowl. The announcement date was already out there. He was already coming to Ohio State. Like, don't mm-hmm. don't don't get that too confused. Um, but he is now the second player in the 2022 class to join Ohio State. Uh, Ohio State in the 2022 class, which is barely started at this point, already has two top 10 players. Yeah, crazy. And that also includes one of the best, actually, currently the best prospect Number in one. the country right now, Number Quinn one Ewers. Overall. Yeah, Quinn Ewers, who, by the way, uh, in a high school, I believe, um, semifinal. semifinal. It's a semifinal. Mm-hmm. They're still playing college football or uh, high school football down in Texas right now. Not exactly sure why. It seems awfully late in the year, but uh, it's, it's 2020, I'm sure. But throws for... 450 yards and six touchdowns because Ohio State quarterbacks just throw for six touchdowns. It's what they do. Mm-hmm. Yep. And they also it says here that this was the for the first time in 10 years. That. Um, it says here that Quinn Ewers throws for a career high 450 yards and six touchdowns in leading his high school to Texas 6A state semifinals for the first time in 10 years. Yeah. and. Like I was saying, they join Caleb Burton, who is the 15th overall best player in the entire country. So currently, Kyle, 20% of the players committed or otherwise, 20% of the players in the top 15, again, 24-7 sports composite, currently ranked to Ohio or currently committed to Ohio State. Ridiculous. And what's in, in, I know we just have a couple more minutes on about this, <clears throat> but well, we also have a what Ohio more State's doing for, for this 2022 class is really, <laughs> really good. They're getting really good talent from out of out of state here. Texas, Florida, another Texas, uh, Kansas here. But they're also keeping those in Ohio to yep. Ohio State. I'm looking here just real quickly. The top three here of Powers, of Hicks and Brown. Yep. All go into Ohio State as well. Yep. Uh, and okay, we're we'll, 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 we're going to hit recruiting real hard in the coming months. So we're going to yeah. move on from that. But keep if you want more recruiting, keep coming back because mm. we have one more piece um, of news. One more piece of news before we get to the bounce back and get to the Sugar Bowl. It seems very, very likely Urban Myers returning to coaching to the NFL, to the Jacksonville Jaguars. It's. It's so hard for me to see that because I just don't see him as an NFL coach, but yeah. it's. It's really looking that way right now. In my mind, this is Urban Meyer wanting to return to coaching while protecting his Ohio State legacy by going to the next level. He's not he's not hurting his uh, legacy at Ohio State by joining a different college football team. And I think maybe trying to repair his legacy in Florida a bit. Because Florida fans are still very mad at him if he goes down there and he makes Jacksonville a very good team then maybe that repairs his legacy in Florida. Uh, The thing is, is that Urban Meyer in seven years at Ohio State, seven, which is his longest tenure anywhere, in his seven years as the Ohio State head coach, he lost nine games, which is insane when you actually stop and think about it. He only lost nine games in seven years at Ohio State. He's going to lose that many games in his first year at Jacksonville. And I, I just hope he's ready for that. I hope he right. has his mind ready for that. And Kyle, we have 40 one, one, seconds. one question before one question before seconds. we go. We go into the bounce back here. If Meyer, this is coming from Austin formation here. If Urban Meyer does go to Jacksonville, would he pick up Fields or or um, Trevor Lawrence or Trevor Lawrence? I don't know. (laughs) That's going to be really interesting. We have 10 seconds left. And with that 10 seconds, I want to say Ryan Day is not leaving Ohio State for an NFL job anytime soon. And with that, Kyle, let's get into the bounce back. 
Ohio State defeats Clemson 49 to 28. 49 yes. to 28, Kyle. That's that's 21 point victory there. Whew, not bad. Considering for being they a were... seven point underdog. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> I always tell you, you don't real life gamble, right? That that's a tenant on this show. I'm not sure which rule it is. It's not rule number one. Mm-hmm. Rule number one is that the doctor always lies. Uh, rule number two is don't real life gamble. Kyle is, is that maybe yeah, appropriate? I, I think, I think that's pretty good. Okay. Rule number two, don't real life gamble. That being said, if Ohio state's an underdog, real life gamble, I, I, I said it. All right. I said it real life gamble. If Ohio state's the underdog, which, uh, sneak peek to the Friday episode, they're an underdog again. By what? how many points again? Seven. Ooh. Oh my goodness. How about that? Kyle? And Kyle, uh, just, just to maybe point this out as well. Uh, when Ohio State defeated Oregon for the national championship game in the national championship game. Uh, did you know going into that game that they were a seven point underdog? They were. Oh, OK. Just just so we're clear. And did you know that and you could you could probably argue this. OK, OK, OK. But Ohio State going into this game without their starting like a key players starting on their offensive um, yes, front there. Absolutely. Uh, Clemson was missing players as well. It's okay. It's not 2020 anymore, but you know, we're, we're still dealing with 2020 issues mm-hmm. and yeah, it, it just sort of is what it is. Um, I would say more notably than any of the players missing Clemson was missing their offensive coordinator and play caller, which I think. Absolutely, showed, yes. And, and that, think, really, that really, that really showed it here. 400 passing yards, which is tremendous. I mean, 400 yards by Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. And I think I think last year he was at close to 350, something like that. I'd have to try to look it up real quick. But the key thing, and I mentioned this in our preview, holding Lawrence on the run, on the rushing yards there. And yeah. what did he finish up here? 10 carries, which includes sacks as well. Sacks. For minus eight yards yeah absolutely uh maybe an even bigger deal etn only had 32 yards and maybe the biggest deal etn's longest carry eight yards trevor lawrence's longest carry 11 yards yeah, by the way that, that 11 really that 11 com- yard carry by the way by trevor lawrence i want to point this out that 11 yard carry which was on a first down was the only thing preventing Clemson, I believe, from a third or a fourth straight third and out in the second quarter. I I don't have that number in front of me, but I believe Clemson had two, maybe three straight three and outs in the second quarter. Hmm. And that 11 yard scramble was the only thing that prevented them from having one more added to that streak. Yeah, so last year, Lawrence three for 250 yards and rushed for over a hundred yards. Then ETN had 36 yards. So very similar to this year. And then ETN last year had 98 yards reception. Yeah. And I, I was having this conversation with somebody in the discord. I, I apologize. I don't remember who, but someone said to me, you know, what if Trevor Lawrence has 400 yards passing this game? I believe was an exact question yeah. that someone said. And I said, I don't mind if Trevor Lawrence, and again, because I was all about that bend but don't break, make Clemson earn it. That was Austin. Was it Austin? Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't mind if Trevor Lawrence throws for 400 yards in this game, as long as it takes him 40 attempts to do it. And it took him almost 50 attempts. 48 attempts. So I'm cool with that. Trevor mm-hmm. Lawrence is an amazing quarterback. I know a lot of people are wanting to call him a fraud, want to say this, want to don't, 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 don't do the ugly Ohio State fan thing. Trevor Lawrence is an yeah. amazing quarterback. He is. I mean, 33 for 48, which is an amazing, which is a really good uh, percentage. Yeah. 33 for 48, 400 yards, throws a pair of touchdowns, has, has an interception, which I'll get into a little bit later. But the key thing here, not just the interception at the end of the game, but he had three fumbles yeah. in that game. Three fumbles. He lost one of them. Yeah. But three fumbles in that game. That is very un 
like uh, Lawrence in yeah, this game. I, he accounted for, for two turnovers, which was one more turnover than Justin Fields accounted for or mm -hmm. accounted for. I don't think that's the correct phrase, but mm -hmm. moving forward. Well, well let's, let's talk about that. It. Let's talk about that part right there. Disrupting Trevor Lawrence. Sure. Last year, last year, I want to compare last year to this year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he should shave the mustache, Brawley. I agree. I think everybody agrees too. Including that reporter who forgot to mute their Zoom call. <laughs> yes. Uh, so last year, I mean, we had great defensive ends last year. I mean, Chase Young. Yeah. Try to get pressure around the edge to get to Trevor Lawrence. And you know what Trevor did? Right down the seams, right down the holes, yeah. and made Ohio State punish. Um, get yeah, punish Ohio State for doing that. This year pressure right down the middle right in trevor lawrence's face and it disrupted him i saw i saw somebody on the buckeye scoop here uh he goes by vb coach uh he watched the game and made some really good comments i wanted to bring up a couple of these things he noticed in the first quarter let alone yes um clemson did score 14 points in the first quarter but you look at pretty much almost every throw that Trevor Lawrence threw mm -hmm. off his back foot, unbalanced, throwing it high receiver has to, it's not right on target, not right yep. at the numbers. It's Which, off target. The receiver has to go and make incredible catches, really stretch out to get those to get those uh, catches there, which, which very prevents, unlike Trevor Lawrence, which prevents the opportunity for them to get quality yards after the catch. Yes. And by the way, so, I, I, I want to, in defense of the Ohio State's corners, may, may I, in defense of Ohio State's corners, um, a lot of people, and I'm not, I'm not saying Sean Wade had a perfect game, okay? And I'm not saying that Seven Banks had a perfect season. One, I'd like to say that Seven Banks had a very, very good game. He did give up one big pass that I thought the Clemson wide receiver got away with a big push on personally. Yeah, that first drive. Yes. Uh, was that the first drive or the second? That was the first drive. Okay. Yeah, the second drive was a third and out. Then they scored again on, yeah, Clemson scored again on the third drive. But mm -hmm. regardless, then they went on a big three and out streak. Um, but regardless of that, the outside of that play, which I really don't blame, uh, put a lot of blame on Seven Banks for, he had an excellent game. And Seven Banks had a real rough start to the season. I'm not suggesting otherwise. I'm really not. But he's gotten a lot better. Again, only six games these guys had to prepare for this. Mm -hmm. Only six games these guys had to prepare for this. Seven Banks got a lot better from week one to the Sugar Bowl. And he deserves credit for that. Josh Proctor got a lot better from week one to the Sugar Bowl. And he deserves a lot of credit for that. And... And I'm, again, I'm not saying Sean Wade had a perfect game or a perfect season. But Herb Street was going in on him. And I felt like it was unfair because he kept, oh, he's playing soft. He's playing soft. Oh, look at that. They're going after Wade again because he's playing soft. He's playing soft. He's playing soft. That was the scheme. That Just yes. because Sean Wade is lined up over the wide receiver does not mean they're in a man-to-man -man scheme. For God's sakes, Kirk Herbstreet, you're a former college football quarterback. You understand that quarters coverage is a thing. And if the coach says, Sean Wade, you're in a quarters coverage here, it is his job to bail. And what was Ohio State doing? Ohio State was doing exactly what Kyle and I said that they should have been doing during the preview, which is preventing big plays, mm -hmm. preventing the run and forcing Trevor Lawrence to march down the field 10 yards at a time. And that's what they did that first drive. And, and I was kind of sitting there, I'm like, all right. I was fine. Here we it. go. Here, let, the horses are out. Let's, this is going to be... A lot of just, people were very upset about Clemson going down, scoring so was, easily no, on the first drive. I, yeah. I was fine with it. I knew, I knew yeah, this I was game fine was not going to be we knew, we knew this Clemson offense and how well they are and how... Yeah. quick and often they can go down the field and score it's just a matter of just making your stops making those stops if they get a few first downs okay that's fine but it's, it's that it. bend but don't break mentality make them make clemson um force them to make the mistakes don't let anything deep go on go behind you which there was a couple but i think for the most part i thought the defense played really well preventing 
a lot of deep balls like what like what how Fields did to Clemson's defense, yeah. preventing those kind of throws, not, those kind of plays. Not one completion on them. over 30 yards. That's, that's amazing. I mean, Clemson yes, you let, you let everything out in front of you. Yards. Yeah, you let everything out in front of you, but you're not letting, like what just said, those 30 plus yard plays. Or even, or even a lot, a lot of the, the defensive players, Jared, they were making tackles. Yeah, they were making really good tackles on Etienne, on Lawrence. They played really sound. I mean, yes, that's the laying the seven yards in front of them. Yeah, but they're tack- They tackled extremely well in that game. That that was the game plan. You're ripping Sean Wade on national television for following the game plan. Now, if you want to say, well, he should be up and he should be jamming the wider. Uh, okay. That's your opinion. And I'm not saying you're wrong. If that's what you wanted Sean Wade to be doing as a fan, as an observer, that's fine. I'm not going to tell mm-hmm. you that you're wrong. I am going to tell you that that's not what the coaches were telling him to do. It's not what the coaches wanted him to do. The coaches wanted him to bail out mm-hmm. because they were trying to let or trying to make again, it's okay that Trevor Lawrence threw for 400 yards because it took him 48 attempts to do it. It's okay with me. Said it before the game, I'll say it after the game. I'm totally okay with it. I mean, Jared, his main because, target, Kyle, Lawrence's main target, Justin Roger, Fields threw for only 15 less yards, threw for 385, threw for only 15 less yards than Trevor Lawrence on only 28 attempts. That's 20 less attempts. On 20 less attempts, mm-hmm. he only threw for 15 less yards than Trevor Lawrence. Well, let, let, let's look at let's look at comparing the two here. So Lawrence, his two favorite targets, his main target, Rogers, had eight catches, 54 yards. Ten. I think that's that that's really well. You hold that you held his main target to no, 54 never. yards. Powell had 139 yards. He he made some great plays. Um so that that's it is what it is there at eight catches 139 yards had um the two touchdowns thrown by Lawrence to him uh look at Ohio State here Olave six for 132 yards Juice Williams 62 yards um great catch at the uh great touchdown to pretty much seal the seal the game at the end of the fourth quarter there and look at this Jared Ruckert Farrell with a pair of <laughs> catches there and at least a touchdown for each yeah record two touchdowns Farrell with a touchdown which was like the most basketball play i'd ever seen on a football field Farrell was covered he was just standing there he was covered justin field says okay and he just because Farrell's like twice as big as the guy covering him so fields just throws it sorry sorry audio listeners fields just throws it like right here and mm. Farrell just sort of goes, okay. Yep, just bo- it. And just the boxes out the DB just there. Sort and... of doing the best he can, but he was just totally outsized. Mm. It was it was actually kind of funny. It was it was it looked like a big brother. Uh oh, I said that phrase. Don't don't come after me, Michigan fans. It was like a big <laughs> brother just sort of holding the basketball out here and just the little brother trying to swat at it. Yeah. The the catch, the way that my little brother, by the way, the way is significantly that, the way taller that, than me. The way that Farrell caught that ball, the way he kind of just snatched it and just looked back at the DB, looked very almost like Gronkowski like in a way where where sometimes he'll just take yeah. the ball and be like, Did you just really just try to defend me <laughs> on that? I was expecting yeah. him just to kind of look at him and do that whole um, Gronkowski laugh and just spike the ball in front of him. <laughs> that would have drawn a penalty, but that's yes, okay. that would have. But oh, what a game! What a game by the tight ends! It was amazing. Even the throwback, the 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 I forget what you want to call, but it was the really long developed pass to Rucker where yeah. Uh, he it's the exact pass that Iowa ruined our season with a few years. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's exactly what it was. He ro- rose out to one side, yeah. looking to his left. And then all of a sudden it's like, all right, just going back this way. Nobody even 10 yards from Rucker completes yeah. it and just walks in that, that that's the exact play that Iowa ruined our season with a few years back. Mm-hmm. 
Yes, and I agree, Austin. The most one of the most impressive plays was that comeback route from Alave. Just makes that DB just so confused. If yeah. you really watch that, he makes a move, gets the DB uh, all twisted, cuts back one side, gets him even more twisted. Like, oh nope, going to come back now and just an easy pitch and catch. And that was, and that if I believe that was the first play that uh, that Fields came back after being out for that one play. I believe that was that throw. Uh, may, maybe. Um, you you might be correct. He only missed mm-hmm. one. Amazing, by the way. And of course, there was a review, so he had a good long time to sort of lay there. Very, only very, 2000, one play. very 2019-like. And he was out for one play for Michigan. Yeah. Next play, rolls out, bombed to Wilson for a touchdown. Yeah, 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 yeah. Speaking of Wilson, Wilson has a quiet game, but uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, because a lot of the passes that he would normally catch a lot of that underneath stuff ends up going to the tight ends instead, which was the game plan. So, and you know what? It worked. Uh, but the really, yeah, this was something one, I, this, really just one big play from Garrett Wilson. He did have a second catch, but that play I think was the play that made me feel good about the game. I was nervous. Most of the day, mm-hmm. the first two drives, well, I would say like the first drive, they basically just they ran the ball all three times, then punted. Then mm-hmm. the second drive, it looked like they were just going to keep running the ball, which at, at that point, they didn't three and out on it because, um, <laughs> by the way, Trey Sermon, 193 yards. Yeah, we, we'll, we go. Get, we're, we'll we're get back to Sermon. We'll Twenty-seven to... minutes. We're here. Twenty-seven minutes. We don't even talk about Trey Sermon as well. We'll, we'll get to Trey Sermon. We'll get to oh. Trey Sermon. <laughs> Trey, um, and, and it, at that point, and I think this again was a part of the game plan. This is what they wanted us to think. Start wondering, oh crap, what's up with Fields' wrist? Maybe because they're only running the ball. They're only running the ball. There was. I think one short pass to Alave at that point, a couple short passes to the running backs, maybe a, maybe a short pass to a tight end here or there, but mm-hmm. it did not look like they were testing fields as far as his downfield ability. And then, then I knew the game was going to be okay because then they just out of nowhere bombed it to Garrett Wilson. Again, it's his only like catch of real significance of the game. But it was a beautiful pass or a beautiful, uh, it was a beautiful pass and a beautiful catch. He catches yeah. it falling backwards, which is, in, you know, looks way easier than it actually is. And sets mm-hmm. Ohio State up in the red zone and they proceed to get the first touchdown of the game. And at that point, I knew everything was going to be OK. Yeah. Justin Fields, four for five on 30 yard bombs, 80 percent completion. And the one, the one he missed, I think, was actually on Alave. I think Alave pulled up on it. was a long pass down the sideline yes. to Alave. Alave ran out of the slot because they, they did some motion stuff. Alave actually ran out of the slot and just did a fade right down the base, you know, right to of, the pylon. Yeah. 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 Right, right to the front pylon. And I, I think that Alave just maybe gave up on the route a little too soon. Maybe the pass was late. I'm not sure, Mm -hmm. but had he stayed full speed, I think that would have been a touchdown as well. Kyle, Trey Sermon. Trey Sermon. 193. Should we we talk about Trey Sermon after our sponsor? Oh God, we are a half hour, almost a half hour (laughs) in already, aren't we? Yes. Yes. I agree. Woody, uh, Trey gets his own, um, segment here. So yes, <laughs> yeah. we will talk you know about what? Trey yeah. after we hear from our good, good friends over at the mad Canadian. This episode's Ma- real fun, by the way, this is the most fun episode I've done in a while. This is, this is a lot of fun. I'm enjoying this. All right. Sorry. Mad Canadian Kyle, uh, real quick before you do the mad Canadian, I was, uh, I'm working on a project for the mad Canadian and we can count this as the ad read, but let's just have a quick conversation. All right. Working on a project for the mad Canadian. I'm not at liberty to talk about it yet. And I was doing something with the Cajun. Again, I can't talk about it yet. No details. Doing something with the Cajun. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't use the Cajun enough. So what I Mm -hmm. do, um, what I do, because I have some leftover Christmas ham. I take, I I, I basically got my crock pot out. Some ham. Some frozen vegetables. Some chicken base, because I don't have any pork base. 
So it's just screwed. I went chicken. Some beans and then just a pile of Cajun. And I'm telling you, it's not ready yet, but oh God, it's good. That's it. That's the entire thing. I'm making some Cajun soup with some ham, some beans and some mm. frozen vegetables. That's that's the that's it. That's the entire tweet. So, Kyle, tell us about the Cajun. You tell me more about it. Sounds <laughs> like that. You already <laughs> you already got this thing going. Uh, the Cajun. It's basically Canada meets New Orleans. It's the great north meets the deep south. Well, how can you go wrong? And Kyle, that's in you can get the Cajun in. Yeah, you can get the Cajun, the just send it pack. Yep. It consists of the SP bud, the Sonoran Heat, the Cajun, and the smoked. I almost almost put some smoked in there too. I think the smoked would have been good in the soup. But no, mm-hmm. we were going yeah. Cajun. We were going Cajun, gosh darn it. Yes. Yep. Um, we'll just name off the other ones too. The the sweet heat package consists of the four horsemen, the discord, two border, and the old fashioned for a good old mix of sweet and heat spices. Or why not just get the whole hog one of each of the 14 seasonings Absolutely. that the Mad Canadian has whipped up in his lab. Be oh, sure to check out code? all of those over at the MadCanadianBBQ.com. Promo code SLOOPCAST10, SLOOPCAST10 at checkout for 10% off your entire order. Med Canadian Barbecue Company, where he has your butt covered. This episode of the Sloopcast also brought to you by the Iron Bean Coffee Company. Kyle, I got a French press for Christmas and I've been using it. Been using it. Makes that, somehow makes that, that Iron Bean Coffee even better. I'm not, mm-hmm. not exactly sure how, but it, it somehow it does. Um, world class. I already did. I already did that. I already told you why you should buy it. I already told you they're world class, fresh, Roast to order, Marine owned, Ohio owned, mom and pop. I already told you all that. So let's, let's talk about some of the coffee. Kyle, I told you I've been using that French press. The two coffees I used in that French press were the Rider Die, which is a gentle, distinctive uh, version of the American classic breakfast cup. Brazilian yellow bourbon coffee beans with superb smooth, smoothness and flavor. And I also made some cast iron. Uh, which is a medium roast coffee with 100% single origin Honduran Arabica beans. I'm a medium roast kind of guy. I love my medium roast. Uh, Don't get me wrong. I still like a good dark roast. And I tell you what, if you stick around for the third ad read, I'm going to tell you more about those. I'm going to tell you more about those dark roast coffees. So, or if you just want to find out for yourself, you can go to ironbeancoffee.com. That's Iron Bean Coffee, America's local coffee roaster. Kyle, Trey Sermon. We call him hey, Trey Hundo one, on this podcast. One, one thing before I go into that, Jared. Oh, my goodness. Making Trey Hundo wait again? I know. Sorry. Uh, Austin asks, what do you recommend for people who aren't as much into coffee? I would be one of them. What would you get me, Jared? Out of from the Iron Bean Coffee Company, if you're not that into yes, coffee? Sir. Yes. Uh, I think the gateway coffees are going to be your flavored coffees. I think maybe that might be a little bit easier to get into because it tastes like something. So maybe the intense blueberry, which is a flavored coffee they have. Um, I haven't tried the mom's carrot cake. I'm not 100% sure what that would be like. I actually haven't tried uh, the intense blueberry either, but I've had blueberry coffees before and they're good. Um, Mm. The mint chocolate chip. uh, I don't like mint in my coffee. That's just a personal preference. Mm. I'm not I'm not hating on it. Or uh, the Loki might be a good idea because it's a medium light roast. So mm-hmm. maybe stick with a lighter roast if you're just getting into coffee. Yeah. Woody G561 at just says, or blondes, blonde, blonde coffee are much milder. There you go. And by the Roger, way, if uh, you're going to get into coffee, drink good coffee because it's good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that sounded way more... Um, it sounded, uh, I don't know, but Kyle, Trey Sermon. We call him Trey hey, Hundo on Trey the Trey Sermon section now. This is all Trey Sermon here. <laughs> Trey Sermon, 31 carries for a buck 93 if and not a for touchdown. That face mask, he would have been over 200. Yes. We call him Trey Hundo on the show because when you run for 300 yards, you get a nickname, especially mm-hmm. when your first name's Trey. Yeah. So over the past two games, Jared. Yeah. 506 yards which is another Ohio State record over a two games per, over a two games span. Yeah, a lot of people have started asking the question or before this game even, is Trey Sermon setting up for a Zeke Elliott type run? Because 
don't let revisionist history fool you. Zeke, while was having a, a good season in 2014, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying he was bad, but Zeke was having a good season in 2014. He didn't hit Zeke level Zekeness until the Wisconsin game, until the Big Ten mm -hmm. championship game. So people start drawing that comparison, and for good reason. Trey Sermon, who's had a good season, all of a sudden Big Ten championship game goes nuts. So people are like, oh, I wonder if Trey Sermon's setting up for a Zeke run. I wonder if Trey Sermon's setting up for a Zeke run. First game in the playoffs. Now, he, he maybe didn't get a signature 85 yard through the heart of the South type play. He maybe didn't get that. But still, you run for 192 yards, 93 yards, and a touchdown against number one Clemson, excuse me, number two, number 11 Clemson. I forget. <laughs> uh, you, you still are starting to put yourself in those annals. And again, 506 yards. As Kyle already pointed out, the most Ohio State rushing yards by an individual in a two game span. Yeah. So, so he's outpacing Zeke. So, Zeke in the 2014 year, he had 121 yards against Michigan, 220 against Wisconsin, 230 against Alabama, 246. Did he have against any Oregon? Yard in, games? That, in that Oregon game, he ran the ball 36 times. Did he have? Because they asserted their dominance early and yeah. often. Uh, which did they did, which they did here in this, Michigan? which they did in this game as well. I mean, you look at both offensive and defensive line, you can just yeah. see that line just push on both sides there. There was a good push. Yeah. Kyle and I, oh, Kyle, real quick. Did Zeke have any hundred yard games before Michigan in 2014? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He had Indiana, Michigan State, Penn State, Maryland, and Cincinnati. Fair enough. Uh, Let's see. Uh, so, Kyle, some things you and I got right, some things you and I got wrong during mm -hmm. our preview. We pushed pretty heavily for a Ben don't break NFL style defense. Did they did they do that? Because in many ways, the wide receivers were definitely or excuse me, the defensive backs were playing some bailouts. So in some parts they did, but also Ohio State had a series of three and outs. There were many, many three and outs pitched by the Ohio State defense. Is that really Ben? But don't break. Did we get? Did we get that right? Did Ohio State go Ben? Don't break. I think so. I think so. I mean, yes. You look at oh, Lawrence torched them in the air, four hundred yards, because he had to. Ohio State scored twenty-one points in that second quarter, prevented Clemson from trying to really mix it up. They had to play from behind down 35 to 14 at halftime. It was pretty much kept it had a pretty much uh, play catch up from for the rest of the second half there. First half stats, they rushed for 48 yards for the first half mm -hmm. all game, 44 yards. They had negative four yards in that second half. Well, that's, I mean, that's mainly due to sacks, right? I, 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 I hate that college football counts sacks against rushing yards, but your, your point remains the same. All right. So, Kyle, things we got right, things we got wrong. Did Ohio State, we said if Ohio State was going to win, they'd have to win playing to their advantage along the offensive and defensive lines. We believed Ohio State had an advantage along both lines of scrimmage. Now, mm -hmm. at the time, we did not know that Ohio State would be missing their left guard. And we did yeah. not know that, that Clemson would be missing one of their best pass rushers, which are two players that ended up missing the game. But, uh, you know, and as far as pure pass rush is concerned, uh, the, the Clemson players not, did, did not live up to his hype, if I may say that politely, but he was still a very good pass rusher. And so, okay, so did we get it right? Did we get it wrong? Was Ohio State dominant along the offensive line and, and defensive line? And did they ride those two things to the win? I would say, I would lean more towards we got that right. I'm not going to say yeah. we 100% no, no, no. it, we, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say we did, we did get that right. <laughs> no, 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 no. 
I'll, 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 okay. Kyle's being humble. I'll take it. That was a hundred percent. Mainly Wait. because of like what we said at the beginning of the show here, making Lawrence uncomfortable. It's not going to show yeah. up on the stats here. Ohio State got two sacks against Lawrence, yeah. but it's making him uncomfortable pressure right up in your face, making him never throw Ohio off his State back foot, making him try to roll out there. We Made never said really Ohio State was going to get a bunch of sacks. Never said mm-hmm. it. Uh, All right, let's see. Kyle, what, else, what else we got here, Jared? Uh, so we're talking defense now. So we, we, we've been talking some defense here and there. Um, Ohio State pitches a bunch of three and outs. They completely stifle the Clemson running game. Uh, Kyle V. Uh, this is maybe isn't pertaining to the defense, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Mm-hmm. A lot. Uh, people were mad at Kirk Herb Street, and that's okay. That, I'm I'm not here to defend Kirk Herb Street. Generally speaking, you guys know I, I I have a mixed relationship with Kirk Herb Street. I do not champion him. I do not defend him. I just I don't I don't I don't, I don't come down hard either way. Although he does not like me apparently. Uh, <laughs> based that purely on him blocking me on Twitter, which, okay. Outside of that, I'm sure he has no idea who I am. But uh, I am actually going to defend Kirk Herb Street on one thing. Some people got very mad at Kirk Herb Street for comparing the hit, the targeting hits uh, by Sean Wade last year. And on uh, Skalinski in this game, Kyle, we're how deep into we're 40 minutes into this episode. You're not even talking about Justin Fields, ribs yet, which like can Kyle, can we hand out the Kellen Winslow? I'm a fucking soldier award for Justin Fields. I guess we did kind of talk about it because you talked about the uh, Olave touchdown pass. So my mm-hmm. mistake. Yeah, we actually just, did talk about it. Just but, what a troop. What a trooper by him. He I yeah. mean. That hurt. I was afraid. I was afraid, especially after seeing a couple of instant replays of him and worse, he got hit there. No padding there. That's right on the side. That's that's a bad hit. That's that's as far as like not taking a direct as far as like it not being a knee hit or not being a head hit. That's about as bad a hit as as you could. Well, I'm looking at that screenshot you took here in the notes here, Jared, that bottom picture there. You can see Fields leaning one way and then yeah, his yeah. whole upper body just going this one way. One of the nastiest here. hits you're going to see. Um, oh, that so, was nasty. Yeah, I was afraid. Yeah, and a lot of people quick, thought too, compete, he, like broken ribs or something. I'm, I'm not convinced he didn't still, to be honest with you. Yeah, um, we, we I, still don't know. Nobody said anything yet. It's still Ohio probably State, too early as we're recording this Sunday Kyle, afternoon. Real, but, real quick, because people always ask us. People always ask us. Ohio State does not provide injury updates until the last possible second. Most legitimate Ohio State media, legitimate Ohio State media will not report on injuries because that's a line that they don't cross with Ohio State. We follow, not to say that we're like legitimate Ohio State media, I'm not saying that, but that is also a line Kyle and I never cross. We the university doesn't, the Buckeye scoop doesn't, none of the legitimate media do. And we do not cross the line of talking about injuries publicly. So just, I'll, I'll save all of you the effort of reaching out to us. If we, if, if, if we actually know anything about an injury, we're not going to tell you about it. And that's, mm-hmm. that's, a, that's, a, that's an if, because we're not, we're not insiders. Boy, I'd like to say but that. But boy, Jared. In that I don't know if it was in third quarter or in the fourth quarter. You've seen that many times on different news media. You see Justin Fields trying to get up on that on that bicycle there, yeah. and you could just see him just struggling. That looked like that looked like the first day the you working thing. out in like first time in six months, <laughs> and then you trying to get up on your high table. And you're like, oh, I can't do this. That's what that looked like. No, uh, that times ten. Yeah. All right. But, back, all right. back back to Herb the, Street. I want to defend Herb Street on something. Yeah. People were very mad at him on Twitter for comparing the Sean Wade hit and the Skalinski hit. He was not saying they were the same hit. That is not what Kirk Herb Street was saying. He was simply drawing a comparison to those plays happening at approximately the same time in the game, approximately. Mm. 
and them having big impacts on the game. Sean Wade was a huge loss for Ohio State. Skalinski is a huge loss for Clemson. They had just got their safety back, uh, Turner. They basically just got their safety back, and then they lost their middle linebacker. And for a team that was having a lot of problems getting organized pre-snap to then lose the guy who is essentially the quarterback on the defense was a huge deal. He was only talking mm -hmm. about it from an impact on the game standpoint. He was not suggesting that the hits were the same. I just, a lot of people jumping on Herb Street. And again, I'm, I'm not one to just defend him to defend him. But yeah. I'm just saying that that's all he was saying. Mm. But these are the kind of plays that hit that Fields took. That's the kind of hit that both NFL and college want out of the game. Yeah. Not not just not just for not, not having nothing the person to do with taking the hit. It's the one who's delivering the hit as well. That targeting foul, the one that they because targeting is actually like three fouls. I think people don't necessarily understand that. Targeting is actually three fouls. And the one that Skalinski got called for is not there to protect Justin Fields. That is there to protect Skalinski. I might be saying his name wrong. I don't care. There's no N. I don't. I still. Uh, Skalinski. I don't. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> okay. By the way, Kirk Herbstreit cannot pronounce Coach Combs or Haskell Garrett. Can I? Can I point that out real quick? Since I'm or failing. Olave, or Olave. But Fowler kept, couldn't pronounce Olave. He kept, he also called him Josh Fields several times. Yes. <laughs> uh, Fowler, that is, not Herb Street. He kept mm. pronouncing Haskell like it was, uh, like it rhymed with Pascal. It was Haskell Garrett. Instead of Haskell, it was Haskell, like it rhymes with Pascal. It was mm -hmm. really disconcerting for a guy who is an Ohio State alumni. Yeah. Which, by the way, Jared, I liked his home setup. You saw how, did you, did you see the um, PR picture that they post out? Just all the um, monitors he had set up at home and even a really nice curved, couple of nice curved screens there I, I too. I did not see it. Uh, if I'll he tweeted it. it you. You, you'd be impressed. You'd be like, ooh, I need that for my Kyle, podcast setup. If he tweeted <laughs> it, I didn't see it. <laughs> no, he did not tweet it. Okay. I'll, share, I'll share it with you, Jared. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, so the point the point I'm saying there is just defending Kirk Herbstreet and and again as, that was as an incredibly Chris, dangerous play. Yeah. That's the type of play that gets defenders paralyzed and yeah. is that's eerily similar, eerily similar to and I tweeted this Shazier. at some point because someone else tweeted it. I retweeted it to the Ryan Shazier hit. Very similar. Yep. And as the great Chris Spielman once said. Hit what you see, see what you hit. Yeah. And you can see his eyes were looking down at the field, maybe at Justin Fields' shoes, not at his number where he's hitting. You And if you're going to initiate contact with the helmet, which you shouldn't do, but football's imperfect and fast, it's, it's, a, it's, it's completely unavoidable to initiate contact with the helmet sometimes. But if you do, you're supposed to do it with your face mask. And a bunch of, I saw a bunch of Clemson people on Twitter being like, well, field spun into it. Field spun into it. Field doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It does not matter because your face yeah. mask should be up. Well, that's a perfect form tackle. That's how you're taught. No, it's not. Oops, face it's mask not. up. Face mask up. That is a dangerous play, not for fields. I mean, it turns out it was a bad play for fields just because. But that is, that is the type of play that gets defenders paralyzed. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Dabo says he's sticking to his ranking of Ohio State at 11th. And doesn't feel like it played into Ohio State's motivation at all. Anyone who follows any Ohio State players on Twitter knows that's false, as I'm pretty sure 90% of the Ohio State roster went to Twitter at some point that night and tweeted something along the lines of not bad for number 11. Mm -hmm. or who was it was it um i can't remember who it was <laughs> they said oh so does that mean that uh <laughs> that clemson is number 12 or is or is that not how things work <laughs> hey man i don't know 
Kyle, uh, we need to get to some Ask Sloopcast questions. You guys delivered huge on these, and we're not going to be able to get to mm -hmm. all of them. If you want yeah, to send big, us big ask one, though, I think one of the big questions here we didn't even talk about um, from Gangland. He he asks Jared, should the Buckeyes continue to huddle up for the remainder of the season to confuse opposing defenses? Now, this is really interesting because it wasn't just so much confusing Clemson here. There was a lot of talk during and even after the game. Does Clemson and before? <laughs> does Clemson steal signs or um, motions from the from the opposing sidelines during the game there? And why you saw often, especially in that first half, you didn't see Clemson all lined up. And granted, some of it was that Ohio State um, huddled up, went to the line, and almost snapped it almost immediately, not giving Clemson a chance of knowing, oh, who's who, who's where, and all that. And sure. granted, to Ohio State too, the two tight end setup yeah. was huge as well. Having two tight ends and in the game – a lot of times on one side really confused Clemson on, oh, what's the strong side of well, yeah, when they split this the play ends. here and who's going to um, – who's covering what? Yeah, exactly. The 12 personnel really killed them. Yes, exactly, Gangland. Uh, the one thing I want to point out, um, and Herb Street nailed this during the broadcast, he pointed out that Ohio State was not – using slow tempo was not using fast tempo, but rather was using mixed tempo, which basically means sometimes they were moving fast. Sometimes they were moving slow. And that was on purpose specifically because Venables, the defensive coordinator at Clemson loves to make last second adjustments. And they were just trying to screw up Venables timing on that. Now, as far as Clemson stealing signals, I'm sorry, I keep staring at this monitor and I apologize for that. I'm sure that looks weird <laughs> for everyone on YouTube. Um, as far as stealing signals goes, guys, I, I, I'm going to break this to you real quick. Everyone, everybody, yes, Ohio State included, attempts to decipher and steal the opponent's signals. If your signals can be stolen, that's your fault. There's a reason why Ohio State has three separate backup quarterbacks on the sidelines sending in signals. Only one of those guys is actually sending in the signals. There's a reason why there's three of them doing it. It's to protect that. There's a reason why Oregon started and it feels like a, a great deal of college football followed suit with those big cards with with symbols and pictures and stuff on them it's to prevent the other team from stealing those signals mm -hmm. if clemson if clemson as they've been accused is notorious for stealing signals what that actually means is that they're very good at it yes that's all that means and but someone in this case here jared yeah. That means Ohio State prepared very well. Yes. And that and it and it really showed 35 points in the first half. I feel like everyone's very sensitive about quote unquote stealing signals and they sort of relate it back to the Patriots. What the Patriots did was film the Rams practice ahead of a Super Bowl. That's very mm -hmm. different. When you're actually filming someone's practice ahead of a game, that's very different. Stealing signs, steal signs. If your signs can be stolen, that's your fault. OK, Clemson did not invent stealing signs. Are they particularly good at it? Apparently. But don't don't think for one second that Ohio State or anybody else is innocent of attempting to do the same. Mm -hmm. Six hundred. And thirty nine yards, Jared. Yeah. I mean, you, you guys uh, going back to, you know. Where were we right? Where were we? Where were we wrong? Um, neither of us predicted a blowout. Um, mm -hmm. We both picked Ohio State to win the game. We 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 did that, but and I, and I did say that the seven point underdog thing was an insult. I also said that, so I got those two things right. So did Kyle. Mm -hmm. But neither of us saw the blowout coming. I said it would come down to the last drive and it did not. 
It was over by the third quarter. The I Indiana. To, it, it, it's mm. well, it. I, yeah, let, okay. me, let me back that up. It wasn't over at halftime, no. but Ohio State felt really good. Yeah, you we felt even real said, good. Even, our, even on, on, on our Discord here, we even said, score 10, 14 more points, and the game's pretty much over. That, that, I, I, I sent, uh, anyone who follows me on Twitter knows I like to send out the Dave Chappelle game blouses thing whenever I feel like the game's over. Mm-hmm. I, I sent it out when Ohio State scored their second touchdown of the second half. And as Kyle was saying, I was saying it in the Discord, two touchdowns and it's over. Ohio State yes. hits 49, it's over. Because people were nervous. Clemson be, uh, by, Clemson missing their offensive coordinator was huge. Can We, we need to address that. In all mm-hmm. fairness to Clemson, missing their offensive coordinator was huge. And that was evident of the fact that they scored so easily, so easily on the first drives of the first half and the first drive of the second half. Because when they had the ability well, to sit there before the game and during halftime and script a series went right down the field on Ohio state, but missing an in game play caller was huge for Clemson. But don't forget too, that, that first drive Ohio state went down the field, but that was that interception. Then it was the first drive. Yes. Uh, Which was uh, by the way, and just, I don't know if anyone's ripping Justin Fields for it, but in defense of Justin Fields, it was tipped. But against Justin Fields, he shouldn't have thrown into triple coverage there. Well, you but the ball was tipped, so you don't know where that ball was going. If that was thrown high, there were still to the, three players. If right it was there. thrown high to the back pylon, only Alave gets a, a chance at it. Or for that matter, because he was throwing to the back of the end zone, he may have been throwing it out of the back Could of the been. end zone. Could have been. The ball was tipped. We don't know. Mm-hmm. So just. Uh, considering the game Justin Fields had, I will give him the benefit of the doubt. Agreed. Six touchdowns through the air there. Yes. Okay. All right, Jared. Questions here. All right. First one, Nomad. Mm-hmm. Probably your favorite question here. Uh, I, if it's the first one on the notes, yes. Can we get a fuck you Dabo? Fuck you, Dabo. <laughs> all right uh brawley asks Kyle, aren't best... you gonna do one i said fuck you as i was reading it <laughs> okay fair enough all right brawley is this the best win since 2014 since well i assume he means the 2014 season yes as the actual national championship game happened in 2015. But yeah. Yeah. That's how I'm going to assume. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm being a, I'm, I'm being a dick by even asking that question. Sorry, Brawley. Um, yes. It's a playoff win, which Ohio mm-hmm. state hasn't had since the 2014 season. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> Brawley says what a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yes. I mean, for a long time, it was the one couple of years ago when it was the um, it was the whole Michigan revenge tour, and then mm-hmm. Ohio State wins it. Samuel runs in in overtime to to win the game. That was a fantastic, entertaining game. Sure, but but yes, this has this is the best win. Just it's on not- multiple on, on multiple levels. One. It's the Buckeyes' first win since since winning the national championship six years ago. In the playoffs. In the, yeah. And then two, getting over that hump of never beating Clemson as well. Yes, that's also big. And also, is this the first game? And I, I'm not sure. And so. it's Day's first playoff victory too. Okay. As head coach. And I want I want to ask this question. I because I, I think this is the case, but I'm gonna say it in the form of a question because I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Is this the first time Ohio State was in well, that the first time that they won as an underdog since 2014 as well? The 2014 season, that is. I think so. Yeah. They've been an underdog in previous Clemson games and that lost. I don't I don't think I saved the tweet. There was something out there regarding to that. Yeah. I don't but, know if I can uh, find Kyle, it. Quick, we don't. But... We don't have the time. This is not a look it up. Kyle, look it up situation. Let's try and get as many of these questions in as possible. Uh, Nomad, yes. Trevor Lawrence is. I didn't even know Trevor Lawrence had a mustache until other people started talking about it. That's how kind of shadow bad it was. Is that I didn't even see it. And I and not not to brag. I have a nice television. 
<laughs> I didn't even see it. So that's how bad that mustache is. Mm-hmm. By the way, always remember to mute your Zoom calls. <laughs> yes. All right. Got, uh, let's I got see. another one. Uh, Tanner asks another uh, another patron. These are 100% patron questions, by the way. Asked in our Discord server, discord.thesloopcast.com, patreon.thesloopcast.com. Uh, you will always get preferential treatment on questions. And since the uh, we've got so many questions, we're doing 100% patrons today. Uh, from Tanner247 on our Discord server, is this a top three Buckeye win in your lifetime? No. Um, I'm going to put both of the 2014 wins because mm-hmm. Ohio State was on a real bad streak against SEC teams not named Arkansas for a real long time and beating Bama. And again, after listening for 15 years that it was the SEC and everyone else and no one else mattered, and then for Ohio State to slam Bama, that was huge. Mm-hmm. That, the whole that, that, to me, that to me is the third best game, the third most satisfying game in my lifetime watching Ohio State games. The and Bama game. Way up there too is the 2002 national championship game that trussell ball trussell ball was in full display all season and all you heard from the time that that's not beat michigan until january was miami so dominant yeah yeah Ohio state has no ohio, chance ohio state legitimately had no had no right winning that game that miami team was actually amazing and if ohio state played that miami team 10 times they'd win it twice uh, but you know what? They didn't play it 10 times. They played it once. They played it once in Ohio State won. And because that went to overtime and because it was a national title, that's that's number one in my heart still. Not to mention that ended a 30 year Ohio State national title drought. Something like that. Mm-hmm. 2002 the first title in Jared and I lifetime. There. Yeah. 2002 against Miami. I don't know will ever not be number one for me. Um, and it's then the Oregon place. win, and then the Oregon win is number two for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, this game might be number four. It's in the top five. Um, and it's and right up there too in the top five as well. Is is it two thousand and six? The number one and two of the game. It should that's it should that matter. Up but the fact that Ohio State went the very next game got boat raced by Florida ruins. Yeah, I know. And uh, and if you want to disagree with me on that, that's fine. But to me, the game of the century, number one, Ohio State versus number two, Michigan's ruined by the game that followed by it. And yeah, that, that's a, that's an interesting question, Jared. That maybe should Brawley. be explored. Just, oh, okay. just, just real quick here. The Oregon game, he, he mentions here, the Oregon game to him was pretty forgettable because it did not feel close at all. It was a 20, it was a, was it 22 point victory? Was well, it? Honestly, I, I combined those <laughs> checks. I was looking to see if that had the score in there. I'm just seeing as uh, Zeke tricked his way into the end zone here. Brawley, oh, no, I, I didn't have the score. <laughs> Brawley, you're not wrong. Um, I, I, yeah, it was 42 to 20. Yeah. Because Ohio State did come from behind against Alabama. You're not wrong. And, and honestly, like Ohio State, Miami's number one. And the 2014 games are like just. 2A and 2B to me. They're in the top and three. This, One's one of them's number two, and one of them's number three. It doesn't necessarily yeah. And this and this game, lot. even though it on paper here looks like it's a blowout, 21 point. There was just so much into this game that makes this feel really special compared yeah. to like the national title, which is a which is number eight there for Ohio State, the number eight um title in the Woody Hayes facility but this game just means meant so much more with everything going leading into the game even though it's a 21 point victory the losing streak so much more now will, will it hold up will it hold up years down the road though, yeah is going to be the question and agreed the answer and i'll answer that i think so yes because of all everything that went into this game i'll say only playing six games just in fields and the 
two toughest games of the year looked bad. Wade Senior and, going to Chicago and protesting and yeah. all of it. It's it's e- even if Ohio State loses to Alabama, which is a thing we're not discussing with any great detail on this episode. Tune in for the Friday episode where we will preview the national title game. This the storyline here. The, like I, I said that the Michigan one versus two game was ruined by the game that followed. Even if Ohio State loses a close one to Bama in the national title game, that's not going to ruin this game for me because of it, it being 2020 and all of the crap that this team went through to get to this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, Kyle, we, we need more Ask Slupcast questions. Right, Dinger, Dinger says, was this the quietest 44 rushing yards allowed defensive performance? I, I, I honestly didn't even think it was 44 yards. I thought it was going to be more than that just because of, especially that first drive, you're like, oh, wow, they were really able to move the ball easily. I thought it was yeah. a lot more than 44. And I looked up the stats at the end of the game. I'm like, oh, it wasn't even 50. Yeah. <laughs> and no, no. Uh, well, it, it Ohio State got up, especially in the second quarter. And at that point, they had already sort of stuffed ETN. They weren't, Clemson wasn't making any room on the ground. Then they got behind. So at a certain, because what, ETN only had 10 attempts, Kyle? Is that right? Mm -hmm. He only had 10 attempts carrying the ball. So with all due respect to Travis ETN, again, he got stuffed early on, but then they just didn't try after that because they were down so big and etn is such a prolific pass catcher that it doesn't take him out of the game clemson at Mm -hmm. a certain point just says okay we're going to start throwing the ball and we'll just start throwing to etn instead of running with him yeah which made clemson one-dimensional which is never a position you want to be in as an offense Mm -hmm. all right uh question from duncan uh duncan says what took sermon from not really good enough for Oklahoma in the Big 12 to setting records and gutting cl- the Clemson defense in a matter of weeks. I don't know. If I, think he, I think he of... came out. I think he came out about this saying that it definitely took him a little bit to understand the offense and to trust the coaches. I don't want to clear something up. I think, really I think it was I think it was Tony and Palm. I think I heard yeah. that from. It's not that he wasn't good enough for Oklahoma. Oklahoma just had some really good younger running backs. Trey Sermon was hurt, so he kind of fell behind in the depth chart. And as ruthless as it sounds, but this is big boy college football, as ruthless as it sounds, if you have younger guys who are playing just as well, you're going to develop them. And a lot of people don't like that attitude, but also a lot of people don't like that attitude when it's on the other side. And you're like, oh, too loyal to the seniors, too loyal to the seniors. So it's, you know, there's critics on both sides of that philosophy, I'll say. And Gangland, Gangland's right, too. He also had a bad relationship with Oklahoma's running back coach as well, which was kind of just the icing on the... Right. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I think, I think just to answer that question, just trusting the coaches and understanding the offense a little bit better. And we, we even... we kind of half jokingly too. I think it was before the um, the conference championship game, looking at Trey Sermon, like, oh, he's getting better. Look at the yards per attempt. It's getting better and better. And yeah. it's just him understanding and trusting the offense. Of, um, we really don't have uh, time to play look. calling. We really don't have time to talk about it, Kyle, but Mayan Williams looked really good in relief. We don't have time to talk mm-hmm. about it, but look, I just wanted to say it. That's a big freshman coming at you. Yeah. <laughs> That's some Mike Weber vibes right there. Maybe dare dare I say Carlos Hyde vibes. All right. Uh Sun Card. Should we take a few days to enjoy the Clemson victory, or should we have shifted to Bama as soon as the game ended? Not well, first and foremost, you're a fan. You can do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> like the coaches and the players do one thing. You can enjoy the Clemson game from now till the day you die or right up until kickoff. It doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want. You're a fan. How you feel about things. I hate to break this to everyone and all of your superstitions. They don't matter. (laughs) Sorry. It's what the players and what the coaches do that matter. Um, As far as the players, you take that night and you enjoy it. You probably even the next day, I would have maybe they took off just to because they traveled and to rest so you take that next day and you enjoy it 
mm-hmm. the day after that, as as coaches at least, you're on to Bama. All right. All right, Jared. Question from Austin Formation. Has Field cemented his legacy as an Ohio State legend yes. with his performance? Or yes. will it require beating Bama and securing Ohio State's ninth national title? No, he's a legend. He and Haskins are a part of the quarterback revolution that is coming at Ohio State. Period. The Ohio State, the entire Ohio State quarterback legacy is about to shift. And and we see and we see who's behind fields right now and who's coming in yeah. as well. Ohio State has two four-star, high four-star, two high four-star quarterbacks on the roster right now, true freshmen. There's a five-star quarterback coming into 2021 class and a five-star number one overall in the entire country quarterback coming in in the 2022 class. Ohio State is undergoing a quarterback revolution and Fields and Haskins will be seen as the people who led that revolution. Yes, it's yes, it is going to be a loaded room with spoiler. There will be transfers. Yeah. There, 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 there will be, be, there will be blood. There will be transfers. I drink yeah. your milkshake. All right. Our right. geographically challenged friend, but Michigan Bucknut, is it me or does the offensive line seem to play better without Harry Miller? Harry Miller um, misses the game due to COVID uh, struggled at times this year, but was doing better towards the end of the year. Um, it's, it's hard it's hard to say because did they look good? Yes. They this is probably this is the best the offensive line has looked all year, but also keep in mind Wisconsin. Because I don't believe the front seven for Clemson were anything amazing. Like I know it's Clemson. I know they're number two team in the country. I get that. But if you want to have a conversation with me right now that Northwestern's front seven was just as good, that Indiana's front seven, eh, maybe not Indiana. But the Northwestern's front seven was just as good. We can have that conversation. That's not a ridiculous statement. Well, especially after what we saw Northwestern do in their bowl game. Yeah. And Harry Miller was a part of the Trey Hundo game, which is official. I have just now decided is officially what we're going to. It's the Trey Hundo game. So they also looked really good against Northwestern. Mm-hmm. And from a pass run standpoint, you're not going to tell me with a straight face that Northwestern was an inferior team strictly, strictly from a pass run perspective, that Northwestern was an inferior team to Clemson. Mm, so yes. no, yes and no. Did they look this was their best performance of the year? Maybe, but well, and, and it also helped they knew he was going to be out and they were better prepared. Yeah. They with who's going we, to be. We found out Harry Curry. Miller was going to miss the game on officially on Saturday, Friday, on Friday. Um, But the Ohio State staff knew for 10 days, a long time. They they practiced around it. It was not a late scratch. Ohio State knew it was coming. Yep. All right. Uh, Z Spikes. Sermon and the slob success in the running game seemed an important key to keeping Clemson's pass rush at bay. To help keep a clean pat pocket for fields, will all day Trey be able to continue his Zeke like streak versus Bama, knowing fields probably won't keep many run options with Bama having a stout interior D line? This game is going to be a little. Is it, is it weird to say a little more Justin Fields focused a game after 385 and six touchdowns? Um, we we we'll talk about this in detail on the Friday episode, but we said previewing the Clemson game that Ohio State should be able to push around the Clemson's front seven and get a lot of ground, get a lot of get a lot of stuff done on the ground against Clemson. Mm-hmm. The opposite is true for Bama. Bama's weakness is in their secondary. Bama has a significantly worse pass defense than Clemson. Significantly worse, statistically speaking. Mm-hmm. There, there is a good post um, that one of our um, one of our folks over in the Discord posted. And we'll save that for um, Friday's episode of some of some stats from Jeremiah. He he used on Twitter. He usually has some good stats. Yeah, 
Um, it goes along with that. So we'll save that on Friday's episode. For sure. We'll save it. All right. Last question from our good friend, the mad Canadian, Jared. Because we can't, we, can't, we can't have an episode without some weather talk, right? Sure. <laughs> he says or asks, hypothetically, mm -hmm. if earthquakes are not weather, okay. as Jared says. They aren't. They're geological events. One thing happens in the earth. The other thing happens in the atmosphere of the earth. This is not but a thing that's up for debate, <laughs> God damn it! But ducks swimming are... No. Why does the number of geese flying alter weather patterns for do they, domesticated sheep? Do do they do they alter I I I question your question. Moving on. We don't have time for this, Kyle. We don't have time for shenanigans. This is not a shenanigans <laughs> episode. Hey bro, we did we did um answer we did briefly say it was like a quick five second about uh coach day to the NFL. Yeah, it's not happening. Not Coach Day has the job Coach Day wants, period. Yes. Um, uh, he, uh, he does ask this question. I'm, I'll spend a little bit of time on it. Uh, Raleigh does ask that question. I'll spend some time on it. Um, time we don't have, but it's the Sugar Bowl victory episode. Screw it. Um, <laughs> this, there's this prevailing idea that Ryan Day is, quote unquote, an NFL guy. And can I just say, for the record, no, he isn't. He has coached for nearly 20 years professionally. 20 years, almost. I think he started, Kyle, do you want to fact check me on this? In 2002, he started his coaching career in 2002, maybe 2003. He's coming up on 20 years in coaching. He spent... Two of those years in the NFL. One with the Eagles, one with the 49ers. And he was a court, not, not even a court. I'm not ripping on Ryan Day, obviously. We're obviously big Ryan Day fans. But he wasn't even a coordinator in the NFL. He was a quarterback's coach. A damn fine one. Don't get me wrong. Or a damn fine one. I'm not, I love Ryan Day. But quarterback's coach. For two years out of a nearly 20 year career in college football. Now let's add on the, so first off this idea that Ryan Day is an NFL guy is laughable. Second, Kyle, who is one of Ryan Day's biggest advisors? Like we Chip all Kelly. know, what's that? Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly ruined, ruined the Oregon Ducks, and his own career by chasing the NFL. So if Ryan Day ever goes to Chip Kelly and be like, hey, Chip, uh, I'm thinking about the NFL. What do you think Chip Kelly's going to tell him? Now, potentially, depending upon how things go in Jacksonville, he might have his second closest advisor telling him the same thing. I just, I don't... I do not see it. I do not see it. And of course, I said the same thing about Urban Meyer for years. And Urban Meyer seems poised to, to take on the Jacksonville Jaguars job at the time we're recording this. That is not official, but a lot of people seem to think that it is. Mm -hmm. So I guess my, my question is... Why are people so convinced that Ryan Day is an NFL guy? Because he spent two years out of a nearly 20 year career in the NFL. I'm, I'm, I, my email box is open 24 seven sloopcast at gmail.com. If someone wants to tell me why mm -hmm. two years as a quarterbacks coach with two separate teams somehow makes him an NFL guy. I never really realized how young he is, Jared. He's a young dude. He's 41 right now. Yeah, it's a by he he could easily easily be the head coach at Ohio State for the next 20 years. And quite frankly, I would be shocked if it's under 10. Now, if you want to talk to me about Ryan Day wanting to test the waters in 2030, I might have a different opinion then. Mm -hmm. I also might not have a podcast then. I don't know. 
Kyle, how, what do you, what were your plans for 2030, buddy? <laughs> we, don't, we don't have time for the long pause joke. <laughs> All right. I think that's it. That's I think it. That's all. I know. I know there was a ton more questions. There was yeah. a ton more, and I appreciate everybody yeah. putting in questions here. But um, I mean, we're at an hour and twenty minutes right yeah, yeah. now. Yeah. Ap- apologies. This is the most questions we've ever left on the table. But we had to spend time on the sugar bowl, and uh, some of these questions, by the way, I know Austin had a few that pertains to Bama, and we'll carry those over to yes. the to the Friday episode. So if you asked a question that was a little more Bama focused, know that we still have those and we'll carry them into the Friday episode. Yep. All right, Kyle. Um, that's it. That's the end of the show. No, no, no circumstance. No, no, no popping circumstance. Is that the phrase? Uh, just, we're just going to end the show now. Um, I will say everyone check out the sloopcast.com that links to all of our stuff, including our sponsors, including our patron, our Patreon, gosh darn it, Kyle, you got me doing it now too, uh, including the Discord, which is free to join. There are premium channels, which you can access uh, via a membership at Patreon, but you can join the Discord server for free, test it out, see if you like it, join up later if you feel like it. So that's discord.thesloopcast.com, patreon.thesloopcast.com. And of course you can find links to that And all of our other podcast stuff, including YouTube channels, two separate merch stores. I'm wearing my Ohio beer only t-shirt right now, which can be found in the uh, 7071.thesloopcast merch store. And Kyle's wearing his uh, crew hoodie, uh, crew inspired, crew parody hoodie uh, that says Buckeye Sloopcast on it, which can be found at merch.thesloopcast.com. And again, you can find all those links at thesloopcast.com including links to our sponsors, social media pages and all that crap. Kyle, what's in Kyle's corner? Um, two things. Um, you mentioned about Ohio State and their record against like being an underdog and all that. Since yeah. 2012, they have been an underdog eight times. Okay. They are seven and one as an underdog. Against the line or winning? Um, it says against the spread here. Oh, okay. That's that's still a good stat, but I wanted it. I wanted you to answer it the other way. But still, if anyone again from a don't real life gamble, but maybe in this case, real life gamble standpoint, I keep staring at that monitor, guys. I'm sorry. From a don't gamble, but definitely real life gamble standpoint. If Ohio State's an underdog, you should probably bet it. But don't don't hold me responsible because Ohio State is an underdog this weekend. Mm -hmm. I'm not putting money on it. And neither should you. But <laughs> Kyle is um, the, no, no, no. You you say it. The the other th- the other thing here that I have here, Nick Saban, uh huh, had Ohio State ranked fifth. Oh, so Nick Saban just didn't just think, a reminder. Nick just Saban, a reminder to all. Nick Saban didn't think that Ohio State belonged in the playoff either, huh? Hmm. So wanted to put in uh, Texas A&M, who they demolished earlier in the year. Oh, that, that's did, convenient. Good. Did they want to put the team that they already beat in the playoff, Nick Saban? Is that what you wanted? <laughs> oh, did you get Ohio State instead? Did you try and... I know, I know that the coaches poll doesn't actually matter, but still, you didn't want Ohio State in the playoff, Nick Saban? Why is that? Mm-hmm. Why is that, Nick Saban? Mm-hmm. I'm talking to you. Someone, someone clip this and send it to Nick Saban. Why didn't you want why didn't you want to play Ohio State Nick Saban? Why'd you want to play Texas A&M again? Hey Jared. Why will you retire before the Ohio State Alabama home and home? Because we all know you're not coming to Columbus, Nick Saban. Hey Jared. Yeah. The Browns are in the playoffs. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> oh, I just I just made a, a decent chunk of our decent chunk of our fan base mad at me. Well, they beat your Steelers, so. Oh, now you, now you, now they're definitely mad at me because you called them my Steelers. <laughs> it's not a thing I advertise on my Ohio State podcast, Kyle. All right, that's all. That's all. All right, tonight's ending music. I don't know why I yelled that. I apologize. Tonight's ending music will be brought to you by one of my absolute favorite Ohio-based bands because it feels like a celebration in here, and gosh darn it, let's celebrate. Tonight's ending music will be brought to you by 
Playing to Vapors. Playing to Vapors. It's uh somewhere in between. Uh, uh, it's like a it's like a funkier, more pop ready, not pop ready, but it's like a it's like a funkier Radiohead, I would say. Like somewhere in between two dollar Cinema Club and Radiohead. Uh, but anyway, they're. Does anyone know who two dollar Cinema Club is? Is it one dollar? I forget. I'm I'm panicking right now. I feel like I'm saying stupid stuff. Regardless of anything else I'm uh, failing to say, um, <laughs> please check out the Playing the Vapors. They're amazing. They're awesome. And they're one of my absolute favorite artists within the state of Ohio right now. And if you could please uh, give them some likes and some follows on all the social media stuff, uh, I can't wait to go out and start seeing some shows again. And I will, the next time they're selling tickets, I will buy tickets and I will be there. I promise you this. So tonight's ending band is playing to vapors. They're a Columbus based math rock band. Um, and once again, check the show notes for all of the information, including links to their, uh, probably their band camp page links to, uh, the, to the song and of course, always be sure to check out the sloopcast.com. Kyle, I'm limping to a finish here. Yes, as our as our fellow listeners are jokingly right now, which is why I'm trying to hold can, my laughter. In. Once again, you made me really insecure at the beginning of the podcast. Now you're making me very insecure at the end of the podcast. You have to stop making me insecure, Kyle. And so with all of that being said, like to encourage everyone to drink local beer, listen to local music, and of course, support your local podcasters. Once again, this is playing to vapors. Michigan yeah. Bucknut says, Land this plane, Carol. Land <laughs> it. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Oh, and I don't know. And I'm about to call myself a creator, which makes me cringe. I don't like it, but I don't know if other creators have an antagonist relationship with their fans the same way i do but gosh darn it feels like some of you just hate me now you love to hate me <laughs> don't get me wrong i know you love to hate me i know i know it's a dynamic thing i play into it too we have a lot of fun but man <laughs> it, it's it's like a brotherly just constant poking at me you guys Brawley, Brawley says you're the energizer bunny. You just keep going and going and going. I'm a podcaster. See, Kyle likes to leave open silences, which is not a thing you're supposed to do in the podcast world. And someone has to fill them, damn it. All right. <laughs> and there you are the leaving the silence again. <laughs> let's go ahead and end the episode. It's my line. Once again, I'd like to thank Playing Two Vapors for ending today's episode. And I'd like to thank the Iron Bean Coffee Company for sponsoring today's episode. Kyle, I, I made a promise. I made a promise I was going to talk about their, some of their dark roast coffees in the third ad read. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, let's see. There is the Odin. And if you do not know, that is the father of Thor and Loki and about 40 other uh, uh, Nordic gods who aren't in comic book movies. Uh, this is a coffee that will keep you fighting long after you should have gone to Valhalla. Uh, there is the drinking from the skull of your enemy, a traditional Indonesian coffee, edgier, smokier, thick, creamy, chocolatey, notes of strong vinegar, sweet tobacco, wine, and spice. There's the fear no evil. Uh, this is another dark roast. In fact, that's a black roast. It's roasted to the brink of flames, rich, dark, uh, void of all light has the sheen of polished armor and the feel of cocoa butter. There's the integrity, which is the flagship roast of the iron bean selection. Dark roasted makes a great espresso. Uh, let's see what else we got here. We have the fierce. The Fierce is a dark roast coffee made with 100% Arabica beans. Uh, will give you the edge and confidence to slay your day. Uh, free shipping over $50. Gift cards available. Uh, and as always, it is a veteran-owned Ohio-run 
uh, coffee roaster. All of the coffees are roast to order, micro batch, fair trade certified, USD organic, all that good stuff. All that good stuff. And you can find all of that at ironbeancoffee.com. It's Iron Bean Coffee, America's local coffee roaster. Hey, Kyle, don't ruin this ad read. See, I can make you insecure right before you record stuff too. That's fine. This episode <laughs> was also brought to you by the Med Canadian Barbecue Company. Med Canadian still still handing out his three, not a, not handing out, but he still has his three. Yeah, you you, you got to pay for those. Yes, you do have to pay for those. His I think three offering packet, is the his word three you're packets, for. the just send it, the sweet heat, and the whole hog, which is one of each of the seasonings over at the Med Canadian BBQ dot calm what is what what are some of those include the coffee and q the cajun the two border the old-fashioned and the mad hatter be sure to check out those and the other great seasonings that the mad canadian has again at the mad canadian bbq.com be sure to also use the promo code sloopcast10 that's sloopcast10 at checkout for 10 percent off your entire order be sure to check out the mad canadian social medias to check out where he's heading out next because he sure hasn't told me mad canadian <laughs> barbecue company where he has your butt covered 